Sometimes the connection between various texts is really obvious, and sometimes it's not. And in this season, the texts represent more of a collection of things that speak to aspects of Christ as he was living before crucified and aspects that pertain to the resurrected Christ and the hope that we have in him. And there are two particular themes that I think you'll find as we, as we examine these texts, excuse me, as we examine these texts and go through them today, and I, I hope these are, are helpful themes to you. How are you all? Okay, that was a better response than I expected. You all look just a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The land of the living dead? Um, um, chillin'? You're chillin'? Is that what you're doing? Okay, so I, I just, I, I need your help really badly today because I'm probably in exactly the same place you are. And I think you probably need my help. So let's get up on our feet, please, everybody. Up on your feet, up on your feet, up on your feet. Okay? We're going to just do a few little things to kind of help us engage just a little bit. The first thing I want you to do is clap your hands three times. The second thing I want you to do is clap your hands three times and say amen. 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 That was pretty good. Okay, now this third time, the next word really has to be said with gusto, or I'm going to make us do it again until we get it right. So this is a clap three times with an amen followed by an hallelujah, and I want to pretend for a moment, not, the, not theologically, but let's pretend for a moment that we are indeed a full gospel Pentecostal church with that hallelujah, and let's put our souls into it. Are you ready? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, great. Shake the hand of somebody next to you. Take a deep breath and sit down. Thank you. Well, I feel better. I don't know if you do, but I feel better. So thank you for helping me with that. Let's start in Psalm 31. And forgive me, it is scripture. I'm just going to use my paper sheet here. There's a statement in here that has great meaning to the church through the ages. In fact, we have hymns that come from this phrase, and maybe you can help me. It says, verse 2, Turn your ear to me, come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Okay, so let's just... Those verses right there, what are some of the hymns we've written about this that come to mind? Rock of Ages. Rock of ages. A mighty fortress is our God. Others? Rock of my soul, okay. My hope is built on nothing less, perhaps. Um, being the rock that the church is built on. Anyway, you could probably extrapolate a number of different hymns that speak to this. So one of the things we're looking at in the season that follows the resurrection is how that contributes to our faith and how we live day to day, right? We're living in a time uh, that's very interesting weather-wise. Milton mentioned it just a minute ago. And uh, we're experiencing extremes in weather that we've never seen before. How many of you have seen the show... I think it's a Showtime, it might be an HBO special, called The Years of Living Dangerously. I think we're up to episode six or something like that. Anybody track with that? It's about climate change, but specifically from the aspect of what it's going to do to us as humans, the way in which human life in our cities and our countryside is impacted by climate change. And The Years of Living Dangerously are reminding us that in many parts of the countries where we thought we were secure in our homes, we're not. Typhoons, hurricanes, floodwaters, tsunamis, tornadoes, you name it, can change life for people or end life for people in a moment. 
What does it look like from a faith perspective when we say, theoretically, if it's wise to build a house on a solid foundation, on a good foundation? You know, and I just have to take an aside here. If you've ever bought a house and bothered to read the print along the way, you know that you have a geological report that goes with your house purchase. And in the geological report that goes with your house purchase, there's something called the liquefaction factor. Any of you paid any attention to that? What that means is how quickly the soil under your house can turn to mud and flow away. That's what that means. I'm serious. You realize that almost everything is dissolvable by water at one point or another. Even the mountains are ultimately dissolvable by water. It may take a long time, but it's, it's doable. So what does it look like when we build a house in a place that's secure and we build it well versus a house that's shoddily built on a floodplain or on a, a, a soil with high liquefaction factors? Well, obviously, you have greater security in time of storm. You have greater security in time of earthquake. You have greater security when the floodwaters come or when something else happens. Maybe you're on high ground and you've avoided it. So even in Scripture, they understood maybe not these things in the same scientific way we do, but they understood them practically. And so through the Bible, we have this analogy of the building made of stone, which all the buildings, if you've been to the ancient Near East, all the buildings were made of stone back in the day. We don't make buildings of stone here in California because they will crumble and crush us in our many earthquakes. But we build things to last given the climate in which we live as best we can. But in the ancient Near East, everything's built of stone. You go to Jerusalem, it's all stone. And not little stone, stacked stone of enormous size. It's, it's quite something. So we have this analogy of the fortress or the home or the city or the whatever you might say, built of solid rock and built on a foundation stone that is secure. And the cornerstone is the most important of that, as we'll see in a little bit. So the analogy comes from that and says, now what do, happens when we as living stones build our lives around the person of Jesus Christ? And that's not in our psalm, obviously. Jesus has not come yet in the flesh by the time the psalms are written. But it'll pertain to that. Here, David is speaking to God. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. Obviously, God isn't a rock. It's not a stone any more than we are, but the analogy applies. How is it that we as Christians, building on the faith that comes in the knowledge of the resurrection, are making our lives fortresses of faith for today? How is it that we are building upon the cornerstone of God and Christ? How is it that we're building buildings in human terms that will not crumble when hard times come, when the shaking takes place, that will not fall down at first earthquake, or will not flow away with first flood water or rain? How do we build a faith that is strong enough to endure and strong enough to keep us going? This last part of this psalm is, is intriguing to me because it raises another question about our experience post-resurrection. It's words that both Christ and Stephen quoted. Christ on the cross quoted these words, and Stephen, just before he went to sleep, as it was said, said this, "'Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God.'" There's an essence of that is quoted in those two deaths. How is it that we commit ourselves, our spirits, as it were, to the living God? And how does that contribute to our faith? David wrote in 31, 15, My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant and save me in your unfailing love. Keep your finger in this. We may come back to reference it. Let's go to the Acts text. This is Stephen. Christ has been crucified, resurrected, has ascended. Stephen is part of the early church, a deacon, in fact, in the early church, 
And he's been filled with the Spirit. The apostolic gift has been bestowed upon him. That which Christ breathed on his disciples has been transferred from disciple to disciple by the laying on of hands, and Stephen has so been ordained. Full of the Holy Spirit, he looks up into heaven and sees something very affirming. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now that's an important vision I would think. Particularly an important vision for a dying man, a condemned man. In this moment, when he's about to surrender life for the sake of faith, the affirmation comes. The affirmation that indeed he is risen from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive and glorified and at the right hand of the Father would be an important affirmation to make if you were a first century Christian laying down your life for someone you claimed had been resurrected from the dead and everybody in society around you denied that such a resurrection was ever done or ever possible despite the witnesses. We live in a society that's increasingly hostile to the idea of faith. It's increasingly materially based and in my view I don't understand where people derive meaning but increasingly our society is, is organized around things that I don't know how you could build any sort of lasting meaning on. It's strange to me. I'm not standing in judgment of the world around me. I, at least I hope you don't hear me standing that way. What I'm trying to say is I'm having an increasingly difficult time understanding how people organize their lives when there's nothing transcendent about them. When there's nothing that goes beyond what they can see, touch, taste, or feel. When there's nothing eternal about the present. When there's nothing that carries anybody forward into eternity. When it's all about life as we just live it moment to moment and it's life devalued because it's life that denies that God is involved in our existence and life that denies that God is the creator and the maker of all things. Maybe you experience the world a little differently, but I'm seeing more and more of this. And sadly, I'm seeing Christians live in many ways this way, in denial of the power of the resurrection, in denial of what God calls us to in terms of building a house of faith, in denial of the importance of what it is that he gave us. And so here's Stephen sacrificing his life, giving up his life for his faith, looks up into heaven and sees the glory of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this only ticked people off more. It only inflamed their fury and their anger. And they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, rushed at him and dragged him out of the city to stone him. It's pretty profound. So upset were they by this revelation, so unable to hear and accept it, so blind and so incapable of expressing a faith or building a faith that they could only destroy it when they saw it. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Father, forgive them for what they do, basically, is what he said, and he fell asleep. Into thy hands. I give my spirit. When do we trust God enough? At what point do we trust God enough to say these words? Father, receive my spirit. When do we trust God enough to say, forgive them, they know not what they do? When do we trust God enough to say, into thy hands I commit my spirit? On what rock, on what stone are we building our house? Where is the source? What is our faith? What's the key and core? What will leave us shaking but not shaken? What will leave us in awe of the one true God but not running from Him? What will leave us with a vision that inspires us to greater things than any human can accomplish. 
What will captivate our focus and our imagination enough to pull our eyes away from the things that constantly demand our life, time, attention, and energy? It's not a surprise that Jesus looks forward to the end of time and says, I wonder if there will be any with faith, any left with faith at all. And as, uh, such, as this precious congregation before me, I don't want Jesus to say that of us, ever. I don't want anyone here to have those words said about them. I want this to be a house of faith where one stone is laid upon another, and it's not stones of stone or people with hearts of stone. It's people with hearts made flesh by the God who turns us into responsive human beings. It's people connecting and living values and faith that run deeper and even contrary sometimes to what's around them. It's people connected to something unmovable, sure, eternal. It's people with something bigger to organize their lives around. One of the reasons I went on a television sabbatical was that, some of you may know that if you follow me on Facebook, Many of you probably don't. I know. I get the impression when I ask you guys sometimes that you don't read books, don't watch television, don't go to the movies, don't have Facebook, don't have LinkedIn, and then I have to say, well, I wonder what it is that we do for fun. But I think actually you're just shy about raising your hands. I think a lot of you do all those things. So I posted on Facebook that I was taking a television sabbatical last week. I don't know when it was, October, and I took one for a time. It was very, very good. Because one of the things I realized was that when I get to the end of my life, I'm not going to look back on my life and say, wow, I really wished I'd watched more television. I'm really sorry I missed all 19 episodes of such and such a show. Why didn't I buy them on DVD and watch them over and over again? What is it that we organize our lives around? Where does faith come in and play a part? What's key to us and important to us? What will we get to the end of our lives with? And when we're facing death, whenever that time comes, be able to look into heaven and say, Behold, I see him, Jesus Christ, standing at the right hand of the Father in glory. I'm ready. This is the one in whom I've believed. This is where I've put my faith. This is where I've spent my time. This is the man in whom I have believed, the Lord Jesus Christ. Will there be any with such faith at the end of time? Peter says it so well. As a baby craves milk, And you mothers remember it takes a couple days for that to come in. And it's rough going there for a while. Peter knows of what he speaks. Everybody who lives life knows of what he speaks. And then the milk comes in and the baby is so delighted and satisfied. Am I speaking in language we all understand? Or is this a mystery? The Bible is so full of earthy and practical illustrations, folks. It was was created that way so you and I, ordinary people, could understand what it was all about. And it says simply, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good, once a baby gets this, this rush of milk into its mouth and begins to feed to satiety, it knows the goodness that's there. It returns again and again hungry to feed. And it says for us to be like that, as we come to him, the living stone, here this analogy again, capital S, rejected by humans, crucified, but chosen by God and precious to him, resurrected, 
you also, like living stones, are to be built into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. I hate to say this, but as democratic as we are as a church, and as low as the ecclesiastical ladder is that we have developed in our system for the sake of the priesthood of all believers. Too many of you have given up responsibility for yourself spiritually and rely on what will be done for you in a moment like this. You have been given a legacy. It isn't I who's the priest. I'm only a priest, not the priest. You're a priest also, part of a royal house, spiritually called. What does that mean? It doesn't mean I'm going to quit being the pastor. It doesn't mean I'm not going to offer you a sermon and give you the best spiritual food I can. It doesn't mean that we should no longer gather but all be forming our own little organizations. But what it does mean is that we each have a responsibility to bring the faith, the resurrection faith, and hope and life to our daily experience and to our walk and to our gatherings as a congregation. Where we have the passion to say that alleluia we just did a minute ago and live it. We're to be spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then it gives us this beautiful Old Testament reference. I lay a stone in Zion. What does Zion refer to? Two things, right? Old Jerusalem and the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem is what we also call heaven. I lay a stone, a precious cornerstone, chosen one. And the one who trusts in him, it's not a stone, it's a him, will never be put to shame. Who is this that we're talking about? Jesus Christ. But not just Jesus Christ. Not the Jesus Christ who was crucified. Not the Jesus Christ who taught on the shores of Galilee and said some nifty things. Not the Jesus Christ who could do miracles. We're talking about the Jesus Christ that Stephen saw, yes? The resurrected Jesus Christ the glorified Jesus Christ who stands at the right hand of God. He who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to, do, to you who do not, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them to fall makes you or breaks you. This aspect of our faith is make or break. This stone that the Scripture is referring to will either send us on our journey stumbling and falling, it will break us or it will make us, for we will build our lives upon it. Powerful testimony from Peter. The important words of faith and wisdom. Jesus speaks to his own disciples, and I look forward to sharing that in just a moment. Before I do, I'd like to just take this blue microphone, and I'd like to wander amidst you and ask this question that I ask in the bulletin. How is it that Jesus' words on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, are lived out in your life? Or... Where do you see the foundations of Christ as cornerstone made clear in your journey? Or, what situations have you faced but that you had little choice to trust in God? I'm sorry, that all sounded so intimidating. And now that makes me think maybe nobody will answer any of them. But let's start out with what I think the easiest one is. What situations have you faced where you really had no choice but to trust in God? Have you ever had a situation like that? Anybody? Amen. Any situation? Tell us about it. Um, a situation where 
I was faced with the fact that I had to go through boot camp and I couldn't do nothing about it. Then I go, well, did I get myself into this? Yes, but only God can make me or can help me go through this. And he certainly did. So you came into a situation where you weren't sure you could do something by your own power. You weren't sure you could survive it. And yet you relied on God to get you through and he did. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else have a situation you face where you had little choice but to trust? I see several hands. This is Cameron's heart surgery. Oh, tell us more about that, Brad. Not everybody here knows Cameron, first of all, and not everybody knows that he had heart surgery. Tell yeah, us about well, that. Yeah, Cam well, Cameron was born, his heart wasn't fully developed uh, when uh, he was, came into the world. Uh, very common with kids with Downs. Uh, so uh, at four months, well, four and a half months, uh, we handed him over one early morning and they told us to leave the hospital and that was that, you know. That so. makes me want to cry. Handed him over, the word yeah. you said. Yeah, and got kicked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we have to be. Yeah, so, so that was, you know. So here you are giving your only son up. You're handing him over, and you know that he's going to undergo tremendous trauma and mm -hmm. risk, and you have no option but to leave the hospital mm -hmm. and say a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Nancy, it is so good to see you. After 53 years of being married and knowing my husband, I lost him. And he passed away. And it was like cutting your arms and legs off because I didn't have anybody else to be there like my husband was except the Lord. And I thank him every day for giving me the strength to go on. So you, thank you very much, Nancy. I don't know if you could hear her clearly. She said that the loss of her husband was like losing arms and legs. She wasn't sure what to do with herself. They had been constant companions for many, many, over 50 years, 53 years they had been constant companions. And at that point, with Ken gone, she learned in that moment that she had no choice but to trust in God for where she was going to go next. Any others? These are great stories, thank you. Any other situations in which you found yourself with no option but to deeply trust in that moment God or to say, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief, as we sometimes have to say. Um, when I, some years ago, I was going through a divorce and I relied on my parents. They were living in Brazil. My whole family was there, and I was relying on my mom and my dad. For four months after I was, you know, going through what I was going through, my dad passed away. Nine months after, and then I relied on my mom. Nine months after that, my mom passed away. All I had was my siblings. They also passed away in a car accident. <laughs> all I have is God. And all I have is Him. That's the only, per the only thing I have and I can't rely on. Wow. A story of the total loss of a family. Father, mother, siblings. And now who do you lean on? Who do you depend on? Jesus Christ. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Yeah, powerful. Well, let's try another question. Where do you see Christ as cornerstone made clear in your journey, your life? Where does that show itself? Christ, your cornerstone. Has that, has that shown up anywhere in your, your journey? I know it has. This one's a harder question to think of an answer for, huh? Excuse me. To me, just realizing that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow gives me a grounding that 
though things change in the world and fads change and people change and situations change, God is there and he loves me and he's the same and he's going to love me. Thank you. Appreciate that. One of my favorite texts is Acts 17, 34 or 43 or 42. Eric can help me with this. In him we live and move and have our being. 28. Okay, see, I'm terrible referentially. I need, I need people to help me with these things. But that's one of my favorite texts. And I think of God as the ground of my being. And that informs my identity. It informs everything that I do. Well, except when I do things I shouldn't. That is not part of the informed. And I occasionally do that. Sometimes uh, very deliberately, which I, I know is sin and I have to confess and work through and pay the penalties for many times. And sometimes it's just the way life works. I'm not thinking, I'm not uh, paying attention to who I am or who God calls me to be. And I might act in a way that's not necessarily characteristic or that goes to something um, reactive that I haven't, I haven't quite conquered. Uh, maybe you have that same, same sort of reality or experience. But for me, this plays itself out in that God is the base of my being, the root, the core. And because he's the root or the core of my very being, my life flows out of that. And that has a very practical sort of application for the way in which uh, things work for me. Anybody else on that question? How about, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit? Any of you had near-death experiences? Raise your hand if you've had a near-death experience. Well, we've had at least one, two. Yeah, I think last time, James, you shared a story. When you were a young man, you were, did you fall down the stairs? Did I remember that? You fell down the stairs and your uh, father, who was not a Christian, told God that if you would survive, if you could be healed, he would follow God the rest of his days. You were healed, and indeed, he did exactly that. He became a Christian and a great influence in the church in you, as you grew up. Is that, is that right? Near-death experience. What can you do in that moment? Others. Richard, I saw your hand up. You had a near-death experience. Was that a time when you were able to say, Lord, there's nothing I can do. This is up to you? Well, it was the time I was living alone in my house. And I said, Lord, don't let me die here alone because no one will find me for a while. And uh, I was having a heart attack. Oh. And so I was in a situation where I had the wits to gather my phone, my keys, and go to my neighbor's house thinking that if I would at least die on the street, they'd find me. But I said, God, you'll take care of me. And so it happened my neighbor was a nurse and got me help through the ambulance, and everything worked out fine, and God took away all the fear during that time. Amen. Near-death experience. Nobody wants to have the cat eat their face off, right? No, it's not good. Not good. Um, several months ago, uh, close, please. Hold, hold the mic. There you go. Several months ago, I fell on my kitchen floor. No one was at home, and it was a crash. It was a split. One front and one foot in front, one behind. And um, I realized it was really, really serious because I was passing out, and I prayed and I asked God to help me. And to get to the phone. So I went to the phone and I called 911. And um, did I say no one was at home? Yeah, so I called 911 and I said, Lord, help me to go to the door, to open the door. And I went and I opened the door. And um, they came, paramedics came, took me to the, to the doctor. They realized I didn't have any broken bones. And I was there just for four hours. And I realized that even when I told the doctors and the nurses what happened to me, it's like they couldn't understand that crash. It was a crash that I 
Even now I'm asking God to help me to forget that experience. And um, I told my husband too, and even then I realized I, I could not relate what happened to me. You just felt like God had been there. Yes, God was there for me. And um, for my, four days after, in the night, well before that, like around two days, uh, um, people were asking me what happened to me. They could see it in my face. And um, one of my neighbors said, you don't look too good in your face. What happened? And I related that to her. And four nights after the crash, I mean my fall, I realized I was dying in my sleep. And it was like, you know, when you boot the television and you see the little lights going and it's like one, two, three, and I said, Lord, I'm dying, please help me here. And um, I just like passed out. And I was surprised when I got up in the morning. <laughs> So I realized God was there for me, and he's my cornerstone. And I have more experiences like that. I mean, almost like that. When we, when we face that moment of the light fading, uh, we're ready to give ourselves to him and, and trust totally in that moment. There's not much else to do. Well, thank you for sharing. When I was a student missionary in Korea, we were in... Uh, Incheon visiting for the day, and on our way back to Gwangju, um, we were driving on a remote road in a Kia Master Bongo, which is a, like a van, and there were 11 of us in it, and there were not seat belts for the 11 of us, so virtually nobody had a seat belt. And I don't know if the driver lost concentration or fell asleep or what he did, but the car veered off onto the shoulder and I could see it coming, and it came to me in slow motion. The mind slows these things down, and it was really like slow motion. The whole thing happened in slow motion, and I knew that we were going to crash. I, I just, I knew with every fiber of my body, and I was able to just say, Lord, I'm yours, and I, I relaxed. I just totally let my body go limp, and the van went sideways, trying to overcorrect to get back on the road, and caught itself on the, the edge of the uh, road and flipped over three times into a rice paddy. And I just remember the dirt and the crunch and the gra glass and everything, my, me banging into bodies around me. And uh, when it was all said and done, my nose was over here um, because I'd put my hands up to protect my face and had broken my own nose with my arm flailing about. In moments like that, that happen so quickly, but that your mind even slows down, in moments when our lives are threatened or when things challenge our existence, we realize there isn't much to do but to say to God, into your hands I commit my spirit. But I hope that we can find a way to do that every day. I hope we can find a way to do that, not just when we're challenged severely or facing death in a moment but that day by day we can commit ourselves into his hands that we might be the house constructed, the living house of living stones and live in faith that way. Do not let your hearts be troubled, John says. You believe in God, believe in me. Actually, Jesus says this. John is quoting Jesus. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. Now, I don't know about you, but I can relate to Thomas here a little bit. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Some of us in moments are remarkably literal, aren't we? Remarkably practical, remarkably dense. We're not listening. We're not seeing. We're not hearing. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me say it again. I am the way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if your destination is God, I'm the way. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And again, Philip, a little bit on the literal side, Oh, well, then show us the Father, Lord, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, and I 
I actually picture him not so terribly patient in this moment. Maybe he was, but uh, I, just a titch exasperated. How could he be anything but? Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. There he does. He repeats it again. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? It is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And that, my friends, there is the key. We come to the Father through the Son, who was crucified for our sins, resurrected on the third day, glorified, ascended, standing at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. And this is what he says. This is what he says to us. The Father, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. That's what we need to, to remember. That's where we need to end up our sermon today and our lives. This is the faith we build to. That God is in us, and we are in God. And what we do, and what we choose, and how we live, and the exuberance with, with which we worship and give and live comes out of that grounded faith, the foundation of living stone. Let us pray. Lord, we need to be reminded of the kind of faith that you've called us to. We get glimpses in tough times, and then we forget in daily life. We journey with you for a while, and then we grow complacent and weary. We take charge and responsibility at certain times, but abdicate them at other times. But you've called us to being a living community of faith, living stones, a sanctuary, a temple built on you, grounded in you. Thank you for that. Help us to fulfill that and bless these, your people, this day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen.